Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the In Doubt Show. Listen, we got a wonderful program today. We're talking about something that I've been wanting to address for a while. Uh, it's a big topic, especially where we are here in Canada. We are leading the world in this, and that is made medical assistance in dying. And now the reality is we're either going to know someone or know of someone who has taken part in this and has uh, done this assist, assisted suicide. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal here in Canada. So we want to address it. We want to have a biblical perspective of how to navigate this, how to help love and encourage people who are uh, tempted to go this route. And so today we have two things happening. We have an interview with Dr. Ewan Gallagher. He's all the way in Toronto. And we're also going to have a personal testimony from Daniel Markin, who was the previous host of In Doubt. He's going to share a little bit about his uh, journey with this as someone in his family has uh, recently done this. And so just get a personal testimony of how that's ha- how it's affected their family and uh, just the struggles with it. And so we hope this is a great resource for you. Again, this is a big topic. We want to address it well and make sure that we are focused uh, on the Lord and what the Bible says and how we can navigate this with a biblical perspective. So we hope you enjoy today's program, that it's a great resource for you. God bless you. Enjoy the show. All right, awesome. Well, we have Dr. Ewan Gallagher with us today, all the way in Toronto. How are you doing today? I'm uh, very well. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Thank you so much. I know we've been planning this for a long time, um, and uh, we wanted to wait because you have exciting news. You just released a new book the last uh, a couple weeks ago, and so maybe for those who are watching, we did an episode with you a few years ago with Daniel Markin, but for those who are maybe new to the program, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you're doing, and then we'll dive into your new book. Oh, well, thanks, Andrew. So... I'm an intensive care physician and researcher based in Toronto. I'm at the University of Toronto. And I care for a lot of people in the ICU who are very sick. And sadly, many of them don't make it uh, to survive outside the ICU. So we end up caring for a lot of patients at the Mm -hmm. end of their life. And, um, you know, sometimes those deaths are anticipated, sometimes they're unanticipated. But because of the nature of the work in the ICU, we deal deal with a lot of ethical issues Mm -hmm. in end-of-life care. So when euthanasia was legalized in Canada about 10 years ago, I knew it would kind of be another important issue for me to wrestle with. And because many of my colleagues were actually quite supportive of the practice, and I knew I was going to be in a minority of people who would be opposed, I really had to sit down and think hard about, okay, where do I stand on this? Why do I care? What is the the view that accords with the true uh, vision of human value? And what is uh, the view that accords with kind of faithful discipleship and cr- commitment to following Christ? Mm-hmm. And then how do I explain my, my views to, to other people? Um, so I had, had to spend a lot of time wrestling with all of those things. And uh, the result of that is is this book, which I'm very excited to see out in print now. Yeah. Praise God, man. So let's walk through How should we then die? A Christian response to physician assisted death. So tell us a little bit about your uh, journey in writing this and your heart behind it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I wrote the book for other Christians, but in a way I wrote it for my friends at work and colleagues at work and mm. people who f- see this issue very differently than I do. Because basically my goal in writing the book was to give Christians language so that they could explain to other people why we should oppose this. Mm. And in doing so to persuade Christians everywhere that we should oppose this, that really the traditional Christian opposition to physician assisted death is the right position. Um, and t- to work through that, uh, you know, it took me a long time to think through carefully what the root issues were. And to me, I, I see it like a number of core, deep underlying issues that really inform one's view about this mm-hmm. issues, like how you understand the nature of human value, how you understand ethics. Is it just about personal autonomy and people making up their mind for themselves, what's right and wrong? And, you know, what is the meaning of life? Like when somebody has grievous and irremediable suffering, which is the, you know, legal language that's used to grant people the permission to end their life. What is the point of going on with that? You know, Mm. what is the point of living with grievous and irremediable suffering? And how can we say that such a life is still worth living? So those are the kind of core issues that Mm -hmm. I really felt like we had to wrestle with in the book. So in some ways, the book is sort of occasioned by physician assisted death, but in a lot of ways is really we're wrestling with What's the nature of human value? Yeah. And and what is the meaning of life in the face of suffering? Those are the big questions that the book has to wrestle with. 
such huge questions to ask and think about and, you know, discuss. And I feel like, you know, in your own experience, how has it progressed? So, so you know, it was legalized 10 years ago. Tell us about the progression because I hear from people, you know, saying that Canada is the leading force in this and people travel literally from all over the world to come to Canada to, you know, do made. And so maybe walk through what you've seen, even just some of the statistics of where we're at now as a country. Yeah. So, you know, assisted death has received widespread public acceptance very quickly in Canada. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a quite dramatic moral sea change in a lot of ways, you know, just a couple of years before 2014, when people really started talking about this, this was basically a taboo topic. Mm -hmm. And four years later, it was, you know, a Supreme Court decision overturning it and new legislation officially legalizing it. So the, the change in public opinion was very rapid. And the consequence of that, that we're seeing is a very rapid growth in, um, in utilization of assisted death over time. So from about a thousand people seeking assisted death in 2016 in 2022 which is the last year for which we have official numbers there's over 13,000 people wow. who sought assisted death and one of the big things that's changed since it was first legalized is that the criteria or the kind of patients who are eligible for this has expanded so originally the idea was that you had to have grievous ir and irremediable suffering and you had to be sort of at or near the end of life mm. it was death was reasonably foreseeable but one of the things that happens when you embrace the idea that death is a kind of effective remedy for suffering is that you start to look around and say hey there's a lot of people mm. for whom death is not reasonably foreseeable but who are suffering in very significant ways and the the, the logic becomes well why withhold death from them so in 2021 the, the legislation was changed to allow people with, say, severe chronic disability or even uh, disability that they subjectively deemed to be severe and made their life not worth living as grounds for for euthanasia. And so we started to see in the media, you know, reports of people with health problems, like serious health problems, like environmental sensitivities. But basically, the issue was they couldn't find adequate housing, and so they felt like they couldn't live and go on with life because the social supports weren't there, and they actually sought and obtained euthanasia so wow. it's, you know you know situations where people are clearly are just in despair and feeling hopeless and as a consequence they see death as a way out and so now it, it's it's offered to them and, and available to them just in quebec in the last week we heard about an unfortunate uh, man who lay in the hospital bed of the emergency department for four days developed this terrible uh, sacral wound on the on on his back and ended up seeking assisted death uh, for after that. So you just have these tragic cases where people aren't aren't cared for the way that they deserve to be cared for and are seeing death as a way out, a, a kind of a salvation from despair. And I mm. and you know that's kind of the inevitable pattern of growth. This thing is going to expand inexorably once you embrace the idea that death is potentially a remedy for 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 grievous and ir irremediable suffering so yeah we're seeing huge expansion and widespread acceptance and a lot of discussion about what other kinds of conditions assisted death might be appropriate for say for example mental illness or mm -hmm. mature minors with serious suffering and so on so th this practice the temptation to expand it uh, will continue to be there because they did talk about the mental illness and then they ended up you know going back and not approving it but i'm sure that's just a temporary you know it's going to come back to the conversation again and be accepted which is mind-blowing to me because if someone's depressed for a day or struggling you know over a weekend and decides in this moment of despair it's going to be better for me um that could change the number significantly that's right i mean it's going to be so difficult to adjudicate Wow. appropriate suicidality which where they would offer made and inappropriate suicidality which where they would try to treat and uh, you know how do you differentiate that as a psychiatrist there i think there's a lot of psychiatrists who are incredibly um opposed to to such expansion mm -hmm. there are others of course who are supportive of it but um it's interesting that this kind of with mental illness we kind of kind of reached a threshold where the canadian public just sort of seemed to say, wait a minute, we need to put a hold on this. And it kind of became a big 
political hot potato, and and so the mm. the government wasn't wasn't prepared to move forward. But as you say, the the way that the legislation is framed, it delays it for three years, and then mm. would automatically expand again in twenty twenty seven. So this is a very much an ongoing issue, and yeah. and those those uh, those physicians I know who who really embrace this see this as a genuine uh, path to empower people. And so they see it as a genuinely good thing that ought to be widely available. Uh, once death becomes therapy, then it then it's a form of medical care that should be widely available. And so you really have two profoundly different ways of, of seeing people mm. and seeing the world competing here. Yeah. Walk us through some of like, um, you know, even just pick one of your, you know, core, like deep roots. Uh, we're seeing kind of the surface of what things are looking like and the decisions people are making, but maybe take us deeper and maybe highlight one of the one of the sections in your book of like, okay, this isn't a core issue that we need to look at instead of just the look at the root, not the fruit. What would one of those be that stand out to you? Yeah. So I would say one of the deep core issues is the question of what do we mean exactly when we say that people matter? Both those who advocate for assisted death and those who oppose it will all agree that people matter. And, one, and both sides say they're trying to respect uh, persons and respect dignity. But the question is, if we unpack that a little bit, what do we really mean when we say that people matter? And, and in the book, I explain the difference between seeing people as having extrinsic value, which is value that comes by virtue of what you can do and how useful you are which is therefore necessarily conditional and contingent upon, you know, your uh, abilities and your usefulness to yourself and to society. And I contrasted that idea with the idea of intrinsic value, which is value that you have just by virtue of who and what you are. And that, that's value that's fixed. It's unchanging. Mm. And, the, and there's not many things actually in the world that have intrinsic value. Humans, mm. I argue, are one of them. But you recognize that when you see that something's priceless and irreplaceable, it's a way of seeing, okay, that has intrinsic value. I can't just trade that for something else. Mm -hmm. And once we realize, when we say that people matter, that's what we really mean, that people have intrinsic value. They're priceless and irreplaceable. That's... Uh, why, for example, slavery is wrong because slavery is just treating people mm. as they, if they have only extrinsic value. And so once we see that, then we see, okay, people have have intrinsic value. Their, um, their value is fixed and unconditional. And once you realize that, then, and you think about the fact that to say that something's valuable means that it's good that it exists. Well, if people have unconditional value, then it means unconditionally good that they exist. Mm. It would always be a tragedy to lose them, to have their mm. existence ended. And so what that entails is that deliberately causing the end of someone's existence, causing their death, is uh, necessarily says that they don't matter anymore, that mm. they've lost their value. And that requires a view of human value that says human value is just extrinsic mm. rather than intrinsic. So even when we say, oh, I'm just honoring someone's autonomy by ending their life, really what you're saying is I'm, I'm allowing them to treat themselves as if they only have extrinsic value. Mm. And so inevitably and necessarily a willingness to end someone devalues them. I like to put it this way, that you can't call into question the value of a person's existence without also calling into question the value of the person themselves. And once you grasp that connection, you see that this practice actually treats people as if they don't really matter in a, mm. in a deep way. They only matter in a very superficial way. And so, you know, given that we have such a deep intuition that people matter, and then coming from a Christian point of view where we see how people are made in God's image, profound worth and value in his sight, such deep value that he would send his own son to redeem them from, from the catastrophe that we find ourselves in because of sin. Uh, we see that this practice is just fundamentally opposed to that, to the kind of value that people actually have. So that I think is just one example of these kind of core deep issues that we really need to wrestle with. And I would say that the widespread embrace of physician-assisted death is a symptom of the fact that our society is forgetting hmm. just how much people matter. We're increasingly viewing ourselves as if we only have extrinsic value and we forget actually that we have deep intrinsic value. Oh, that's such a good word. Such a good word. How would you, you know, because you're in this field, you're in this world, how would you help a young person maybe who is, you know, getting into medicine or getting into the medical field? How did you navigate it yourself and how would you encourage a young person who's you know maybe wrestling with 
being in that world and in that field when all this is, a lot of people are saying yes and amen. Yeah. I, you know, the, I think there's, this is not the first big moral challenge that mm. as a Christian we have faced with respect to being involved in the medical profession. I mean, abortion was accepted and, and legalized in Canada a long time ago and going through medical school, you know, you would hear a lot of adv advocacy for abortion and you have to be willing to sort of recognize that in some senses you're in a moral minority as mm. a Christian who's committed to a pro-life position. Mm. But at the same time, um, there is a gr immense good that medicine does. And I think the sad thing about these kinds of issues is that it obscures mm. the fact that the medical profession is deeply uh, aligned with Christian values, you know, caring for the body, showing compassion, caring for the sick, et cetera. Those, these are, you know, things that are deeply aligned with Christian values. And although these uh, moral conflicts create some challenges for us, you know, it's deeply, it's a deeply good thing to engage in the practice of medicine. And so what I would say to young people out there is absolutely pursue this, mm. be salt and light. Mm. And if, you know, it's hard to get in, but if God opens the door um, and is calling you to this, then, then, it, then it's good work. Mm -hmm. And um, inevitably, people will respect people who are excellent in their work, who are collegial and respectful. And I, I really tried in my in this book to to write it with a tone that showed respect for the other side and not just right. criticizing them yeah. all as evil and and morally blind. Because I think some of at least some of you know obviously we're seeing a lot of. Um, disturbing things around this, but I also know that people are genuinely grappling with how do we address the problem of evil and suffering in our world. Mm -hmm. And that lack of, lack of spiritual resources that, you know, th that many people have outside the gospel means that they're going to turn to other solutions that, yeah. that we're going to find problematic. And so ultimately at the end of the day, um, we need to be present mm -hmm. in order to be a faithful witness. And so I would encourage people to pursue the profession. Yeah, that's so good, man. That's so good. And, uh, you know, we talk about this often, even just my wife and I, just we see that, you know, it's happened in our family where someone decided to do this and we found out about it very last minute, like the day before. And, um, you know, it was very shocking to us. And it's only a matter of time as this continues to get more popular that every family is going to be affected or know someone, like we're all going to be touched by this reality. Um, what would you say... Um, you know, to someone who knows someone who's, you know, tempted to go this route, how would you help them and give them wisdom on how to navigate those conversations? Yeah. I mean, I think I would say two things. I think, I think just the fact that we can anticipate this problem highlights the importance of talking about it before it becomes a personal issue. Mm -hmm. You know, D.A. Carson, you know, well-known Christian teacher, wrote a, a book on suffering called How Long, O Lord. And in there, he wrote something that always struck me, which is that the time to prepare to suffer, the time to build the kind of theological equipment that you need to suffer well is way before you ever end up mm. in the midst of some cr crucible of suffering. Because yeah. in the midst of the crucible, emotions are high and, and, and it, it's a genuine personal struggle and uh, you're going to be able to respond to that and deal with it well if you've mm -hmm. already worked through and thought about it. So I think that really extends because the issue of physician-assisted death is really ultimately a question of how should we respond to the problem of suffering. Mm. And I try to address that in, in one of the chapters in the book because I think that's one of the other core issues here is, is how do we respond to suffering? How do we make sense of it? Um, so I would encourage people to really equip themselves well and to, you know, help their churches be well equipped so that people have, have Christians everywhere be well discipled on these kinds of issues up front so that when the time comes, the right responses will be more intuitive mm -hmm. and, and easier. But when we do encounter this, when we have friends or loved ones who are seeking assisted death, I think the first thing to do is just to bear in mind that we need to be deeply respectful. These are very personal issues, mm -hmm. very difficult. And, um, at the end of the day, each one of us is responsible for for our own choices. Mm -hmm. um, if you know, if I had a family member or a loved one or a friend who was thinking about this, I would, I would. The first thing and the foremost thing is, I would just 
through my words and my actions, try to remind them of just how much they matter, Mm. how much we value their presence. And often that means spending time with people, being there for them. Because I think a big driver of this is this sense of being a burden, sense of loneliness, sense of isolation. And so we want to act proactively to address those things, to make sure people know that their presence is loved and valued, that we don't see them as a burden. Mm. And that just means sacrificial uh, love of, of, of many different kinds. And where the opportunity arises, you want to be prepared to explain to them why you can't support that decision. But again, mm-hmm. doing it in a way that's very respectful and loving. And, um, and, and hopefully you can be a faithful witness uh, to them in, in both through your words and through your deeds mm-hmm. in their time of need. That's so good. And I mean, I know we clearly see that it's you know, wrong, and we don't agree with it as far as our Christian perspective. Could you give us some of the point forms of what that conversation would look like when you wanted to have a moment, when you have a moment to maybe address some of the concerns? What are some bullet points of words that you would give that might help a young person who's watching this? Um, You know, I think the big thing is, first of all, to say, you know what, the reason why I can't support this is because you matter too much. Mm -hmm. You're sacred. You're not disposable. You're not the kind of thing that we can just dispose of when it's not working properly. And because you matter so much, you're untouchable. And I don't think that anyone should lift uh, their hand to end you. And mm. uh, and that's why I can't support this. That's the first thing. You want them to see that you oppose it, not because you don't care about what they want, but rather because of you have such a high view of how much they matter. You They're sacred and untouchable yeah. and holy. Yeah. And and so you, it's because you value them so much that you that you can't support it. And then I think the second thing is just just to point them to the gospel and say, you know, the gospel teaches us that even when we suffer, mm-hmm. uh, life can be worth living because what we ultimately need is not freedom from suffering. What we need is communion with God and mm-hmm. and and love uh, from one another and. You can still faithfully worship God. You can still faithfully serve God as you go down the path of suffering. Um, Of Mm. course, this is going to be compelling to someone who has faith or understands the gospel. But ultimately, we have to help people see that their existence really matters even whenever they have to suffer Mm -hmm. and and, uh, things are difficult. Um, And so to me, that inevitably involves helping them to understand that they're made by God for a reason that God loves them. He gave his son for them and ultimately they're reconciled to him and they can serve him and, and worship him even in the face of difficulty. So their, their life still matters and they, Mm -hmm. and their existence still has purpose. So those are the kind of things that I would want to go to talk about value and talk about purpose and meaning Mm -hmm. and uh, just remind them just how much they matter. Yeah. That's so good. I love that. Um, and I love that, um, you know, you even mentioned earlier, as this continues to get more popular, we need to be prepared now, bef- you know, so that we're trained and equipped for those conversations. And so don't wait for those situations. If you're watching, don't wait for those situations to come um, to your, you know, your story, but be prepared, be ready now. Um, I always give the analogy of like, you know, someone who's swimming or learning to swim you practice swimming in the shallow end so that when someone drops you in the deep end, you don't sink, you're prepared. And so you got to practice and be ready for when those moments come. It's really interesting that you mentioned this because you talk about how we don't know how to suffer well. Um, we just think, okay, you know what? I'm suffering. This is hard. I'm just going to end it. And, you know, I have chronic pain in my neck and my back and I have a whole bunch of things um, that are going on that I've recently been aware of um, with an MRI. And, knowing that the pain is permanent and the doctor neurosurgeon saying that it's never going to go away. You can never do this again. You can never do that again. I came home and I was actually pretty bummed out and depressed and, you know, had days of weeping over this new reality for my life. And, you know, I would never consider made, but I was aware of, man, this chronic pain, it's 24 seven. I hate it. It's terrible. I can see why, someone who is struggling every single day with something, it makes sense that it looks like, you know, ending it is the best result. Um, How could you encourage us to suffer well? Because, you know, we see through scripture, we see Jesus's life, we see the cross, we see Paul and all these things that Paul's went through. 
And then he talks about how it's light and momentary affliction, and he gives a long list of all the things he's been through. Um, you know, these guys weren't, you know, they all suffered. Um, how do we suffer well instead of just say, you know what, I can't take it anymore? So, yeah, towards the end of the book, I, I address this very directly and mm. address it by recounting the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And in that story, I see very clearly the ways in which Jesus invites us to cultivate the virtues of faith, hope, and love that we need to suffer well. You know, mm -hmm. we need the virtue of faith because really suffering is a test of faith. Can I trust God mm -hmm. that his purposes are such that in the end, I'll be able to look back and say that was worth it. Mm -hmm. Somehow in the face of that evil, like, like Joseph, you know, the story of Joseph, he looks back on his life and his brothers are there apologizing to him and hoping that he doesn't crush them. And he says, you know, you intended it for evil, but mm. God intended it for good. And the confidence that we need in the face of suffering is that somehow we're going to be able to look back and say it was, it was evil, but God intended it for good. And, and, and ultimately we'll be able to say, God got glory and we found mm. joy and peace in, in the midst of this. And we know God better than we could have otherwise. And if knowing God is the highest good, mm. then suffering could well prove to be worth it but in the moment we need the faith to yeah. trust god that he's at work that he's he, that he has the power also to bring about th those goods um mm. so it's a huge test of faith so we need to cultivate the virtue of faith the second thing i would say is cultivating the virtue of hope the confidence that yeah in this life we suffer mm -hmm. and it's difficult and suffering has entered my life in pretty significant ways too and the thing that fills me with hope is the hope of the bodily resurrection. Mm. You know, one day you will have a new, I'm not sure what the pathology is, but you're going to have a new neck and a, mm. a new body and there's going to be no pain and it's going to work perfectly. Yeah, amen. And, and setting your heart on, the, on that hope is what makes the gospel so powerful. Because mm. if we don't have that, if we've got nothing to look forward to, yeah. well, then it's easy to fall into despair, I think. And then finally, I would say the virtue of love love to God and to others, rec recognizing that ultimately the highest good is knowing God because he is the most valuable being there mm -hmm. is. He is the, He is our highest good. And so what we really need is to grow closer to him, to know him and to be known by him. And often our suffering enables that in ways that would not otherwise be possible in this life. So mm -hmm. Those, I think cultivating those virtues of faith, hope, and love are what enable us to to bear through when we're called to suffer in difficult ways. Yeah, it's a good reminder. And I think even just the reminder of hope. Sometimes we're just so earthly focused, we forget, hey, there is a new neck and a new back and a perfect spine waiting for me. Yeah. Um, that's, a good, that's a good reminder. Um, what would you tell someone? So we talked about... And I mean, I'm guessing the conversation would be pretty similar if we have a young person or someone who is who knows someone to counsel them. Um, have you had opportunities where you've spoken to someone who is committing to do this and you were able to have conversations with them to help them navigate that? Or are you allowed to do that in your profession? Well, I think as a physician, you can certainly counsel someone um, mm. to... Uh, uh, you know, about, about this option and other options, it wouldn't be a situation where I would raise, you know, religious beliefs unless mm -hmm. the patient raised them and, and had questions. But even then I'd be very cautious because we, you know, you really want to avoid yeah. taking advantage of the power dynamic in the physician patient yeah. relationship. Um, because I work in critical care and a lot of my patients are generally incapacitated by their illness, it's been very rare that I've run into this. Mm. Um, I certainly have had families raise it and talk about it, but in the ICU generally when we're at or near the end of life, it's really about just making sure people are comfortable mm -hmm. thinking about the appropriate timing of withdrawing life support. And right. we don't fortunately have to go there uh, very much. So I haven't, I it, you know, I actually when I first started really wrestling with this, I expected to have to deal with it more than, yeah. than I have actually in, in my particular area of practice. But I know a lot of other colleagues who've had to deal with it a lot. And I think, you know, particularly in primary care. So mm. it really kind of depends where you're situated. Yeah. 
Yeah, interesting. And um, one more question. Uh, how would you counsel or help someone who, you know, we've talked about who are thinking about it or entertaining it, but, uh, you know, how would you counsel me losing someone to it? Um, what would you say to someone who's um, lost someone uh, due to MAID? Well, I, you know, I'd want to understand, first of all, how they felt about it. Um, I'd want to understand if there was any particular aspects of it that troubled them. Hmm. Um, in some ways, it's like losing someone to suicide. There's a kind of difficult grief that can be involved that some people describe. So, I, you know, I just want to comfort Mm -hmm. and uh, encourage and, you know, say your, your grief reminds you just how much that person mattered, mm. how special they were, and um, uh, pray that, that the Lord would be able to comfort you in, in your moment of loss. That's That mm -hmm. grief that we feel is appropriate because people are priceless and irreplaceable. And it's funny, sometimes the best way to see how much people matter is to go to a funeral mm and just be reminded of that deep sense of loss that we feel when, when somebody leaves us. So I'd want to encourage them. God is gracious yeah. Yeah. and, um, and is with you and can comfort you even in the face of your tremendous loss. Yeah, that's good. That's a good word, man. Well, we really appreciate your time. We appreciate this resource that you have and we'll leave a link in the description so people can go and grab a copy. Cause I think it's again, something we need to be training and understanding and equipping ourselves now because it's only going to get, uh, you know, exponentially worse, it seems, as things keep getting, um, you know, yes and amen uh, in our country anyways. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're prepared, we're equipped, we're ready to have these conversations and love people well and point people to Christ well. So thank you for your book. Thank you for your resource for us. And um, all the best to everything you're doing in your life, in your family, and in your work. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. Awesome. That was a great interview. I hope that was a great resource for you. Lots of wisdom there. I'm grateful for our brother. And uh, we have a little extra segment today because we're going to have Daniel Markin join us as we just talk through a little bit more of this topic and share some of his story because I know he personally experienced this. So Daniel, how are you doing today? Hey, doing well, Andrew. Good to see you. Good to. I mean, anytime I get to see you is amazing. I know. And, and, I, and uh, I can't wait till you're in the flesh, bro. Dude, soon. Soon. We, we should. I wanted to surprise you sometime. And just show up and be sitting in the chair and you come in and walk into work. And... I would feel so excited. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Um, so we're praying that happens. But um, I know you've experienced um, this in your family. And I want to just touch base with you. Just have an, a perspective for people who are watching who maybe haven't experienced this yet. You know, the reality is, as this continues to go, a lot of people are going to have to deal with this reality in families and loved ones and friends or friends of friends, we're all going to be a part, we're, it's all going to be, um, we're going to experience Everyone it. will be touched yeah. by it. Everyone's going to be touched by it regardless. Totally. Um, and you know, like you, you, you're you chatting with you and I actually got to interview you in last time. That's right. Uh, that he was on the show. Yep. And so we talked about all the same stuff and it's amazing how quickly yes. it has progressed as well and, yes. and, and how that has happened. But I still sense that for everyone, yeah, everyone's going to be experiencing it now. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Um, but also, it doesn't make that experience a little bit e like any easier. Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of what the lie is, is that, oh, it'll be okay. It'll be easy. Yeah. And it's not. It's different. I, I think as Christians, when we realize what's going on, uh, there's in our spirit, it just, the, the, the coin can't drop. Yeah. Like the penny can't drop. You can't swallow it. You can't um, understand. Mm -hmm. Like, the, or you can't be deceived. Maybe that's a better way of putting it yeah. about what's happening. Yeah, it's a good word. And we'll leave a link in the description for you guys to watch the episode or listen to the episode that Daniel did um, with you and before. And so maybe you can yeah. watch that too because it's a great resource. Maybe Daniel, if you're able and comfortable, just share a little bit about your journey because I think at the end of the day, everyone we talk to eventually is going to know someone or heard of someone in you know close proximity who has experienced this. Yeah, the what we give it the name made medical assistance in dying, but like I've heard it called like assisted suicide, and yeah. and I think like so from my experience, my family's experience, that's more what it feels like. 
Mm. I think so much of this is talked about and, and branded and packaged as a, um, uh, a, a benefit and a good thing and you're actually doing a service to others mm. and i you know i think it's all lies because when when you experience it you begin to look through the 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 plastic wrap and you're like wait a minute that's not what i mm. imagined or signed mm -hmm. up for and so it's odd i mean a little bit about like my family i had an aunt who uh had cancer for you know was fighting cancer for a while and it got to the point where like um, it was not going well. And, and so she had alerted our family that she was going to, uh, choose the medical assisted in dying. And we were all kind of pretty shocked by that, but she's like, it was, she was going to be doing that five months down the road or so. It's like, look, if, if the cancer hasn't, none of the treatment was working, she went off chemo. She's like, if it doesn't take me by then, which it should, I will, um, opt for that and 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 she i think wanted to kind of be in control of that that was sort of her way of um going through life in that sense so it was a little off-putting kind of forgot about that and then uh my parents got a call they're like hey um my aunt's not doing well they packed up everything they drove up to go see her and it was kind of like hey you got 24 hours and oh by the way they've moved the date up she chose to move the uh wow. suicide date up to tomorrow so if she doesn't pass in the night, it'll happen like tomorrow at 8 a.m. Wow. And my parents were like, are you kidding me? So like they they went up there and uh, and spent time with her. And, you know, like, and it's the type when someone's that sick, like there's some response and things and they want to be there with her. But they were caught in a hard place of like, like as my dad would describe it, he's like, this was not a fun or peaceful thing. Like what he and he's been in the room when people have died, too. Hmm. He's been in the room when families are, are surrounded and the person takes the last breath and, uh, and there's this peace and this quiet and like, they've just, they've just passed on. But he said, this wasn't like that. He said it was a, an execution. It felt like an wow. execution, like, like, like they do in prisons, right? Where they used to do the lethal injection and, and that's what it is. And he said, the weirdest part is they're all sitting numb waiting for this to happen because she didn't pass the night. And the doctor came in and was so cavalier about it all which was you know the bedside manner was really poor like he walked in and was like hey you guys can all talk if you want you can all talk you can all um you know it's fine and everyone was of course just stunned silence and then it just just the, like the bedside manner of it all and then administered the injection and my you know like it still messes with my family that was my wow. dad's sister he had to like hold her hand as as she was killed Oh my god! So, you know that that's still impacting him. It's still messed with him. It for me is uh, I I had a weird grieving process with it hmm. because it was the sort of thing that was um I was so sad to lose my aunt, but yet so like angry that that's how it went out. It felt like someone took her. Hmm. Right, the Lord didn't take her; someone else did. And, uh, and, and that is something that I've like, it, when I reflect back on it, I'm, I'm still frustrated. It's still something wow. I have to go to God for and, and to go to him for, because it's, I'm still angered by that. And I, and it, like, I can try and tell myself like, uh, Hey, this is, um, you know, she, she, it was a more peaceful way to, for her to go than to suffer, but not necessarily like she was on so many, so much meds that like, she probably mm. wouldn't be feeling anything at that point. So it's just, uh, hmm. it's a mess. And I don't know, we, we were talking a little bit before, but on this whole, and, and I know when you, when you talk with you and, or, um, I've talked with you and before, um, previously on this show, mm -hmm. it is a, you can tell an idea is not of God and that it's demonic and that instead of bringing life, instead of bringing human flourishing, it destroys mm -hmm. and tears down mm -hmm. uh, and leads to non-flourishing. I would place assisted suicide in that category. I'd place um, the transgender mm -hmm. movement in that category. It's destroying and it doesn't lead to flourishing. Abortion is destroying. Mm -hmm. It's not leading to – like these ideas do not lead to human flourishing. Mm -hmm. It's it's different than a surgery that's being used to save and help someone with flourishing to make them better. Mm -hmm. This is instead of making them better, it's just destroying. And uh, and I think that's an important distinction to make as we talk about something super heavy. Is yeah. does it lead to actual flourishing 
or destroying. Because in cancer, yeah, you destroy the cancer, but the hope is that it would lead to flourishing afterwards. Right. Um, not lead to nothing. That's a good word and a good way to like kind of put things through like a litmus test almost and just kind of see, okay, what's happening here? Because I mean, obviously when you read through scripture, the Bible says that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Yeah. And so when you're thinking of all these things with abortion and transgenderism and all the the movement and um, with medical assistance and dying, okay, Mm -hmm. steal, kill, destroy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I'm glad you brought that up because I think we can tend to um, sometimes not apply that scripture in a really simple way, mm. in a very practical way. Mm. And that here's where we're talking about something in a very practical way that um, applying it so simply, Satan comes to steal, kill, destroy. And that is what's happening if yeah. you have the eyes to see it yeah. um, in our culture. And and so, and just so weird that it's celebrated and, and made yeah, so happy. And that's they, the they weird package part. package it is so peaceful. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's odd. Yeah, even like when we uh, we saw like a little clip at our church because we were just kind of walking through what like the government's doing with MADE and it was showing like these little coloring books for kids, like teaching kids what it's about so that they can be prepared when, you know, family or friends go through it. I'm like, what is going on? Like what's what's good is bad and what's bad is not only good, it's celebrated and praised and exciting yeah. and they try to make it seem like it's this amazing thing. And you're like, man, this is so backwards. Yeah. Yeah. It is so backwards. And and I've heard too, like from lots of firsthand accounts, especially people in palliative care, people, they'll say they want this. Take me out of my misery. Just please. Like I'm in so much pain. Hmm. I'm so miserable. But those who, if you can provide the, you can take the pain away and they can kind of come back to like from that, not the like the fight or flight, I think when you're in so much pain, your body's just in flight mode. Yeah. Like, what do I do? Just yeah. end this. Yeah. And I think when you can reduce that pain, um, you know, they, my understanding is talking with those who are Christians working in palliative care, those people are, they they want to be with their family mm. um, and they want to keep living. Yeah. And so, and keep fighting. And so it's, pain management is the other option mm-hmm. that is not given. And and you hear it just wacky stories. I, I'm not the authority on this, so I can't speak, to, but like I heard of one like there, uh, they were one lady who I think was, was she had like an army, like she was in the military and then she was going to be homeless. And they said, well, have you thought about assisted suicide? Or it's like, I might be paraphrasing the situation, but I heard something wacky like yeah, that. I was thinking, yeah. are you kidding me? Are we, we going to offer it that loosely now? Um, the, the scary one though is offering it for mental health. And I do. There was a story of that, that in, in, yeah. well, it was going to happen in parliament. I think it got pushed. It back. did get pushed back, but I, I heard yeah. someone was reading through and Mark has even mentioned this kind of going through. It was in the news where someone was struggling with depression or whatever. And they went to the hospital and they just said, Hey, like we, we can't help you, but we can offer you um, medical assistance in dying. And she said, no, yeah. no, like I don't want to die. I just, I'm struggling with depression. Like I just need help. It's like, sorry, all we could offer you is made. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. Oh wow. That's terrible. And then you think yeah. of like the perspective of the doctors, like Christian doctors who are being, you know, pushed to do this. It's like, how do you? Mm-hmm. Our, our health system's a juxtaposition because we will spend. So I, I always describe this about my twin girls. Like we spent two and a half months in the hospital. And so they're with some of the best doctors, the best treatment, some of their, because they're premature, they're two and three pounds when they came out. Mm-hmm. So we did two and a half months in the hospital. And had we not been from Canada, not covered by healthcare, we uh, would have paid out of pocket about one point six million dollars, oh, yeah, and that's sure. not including the surgery. That's not including yeah. the initial yeah. um, appointments. Mm-hmm. But like the same health authority will will fork out one point six million dollars to keep my girls alive, and also equally recommend terminating them. Yeah, it's really weird. And it's it's weird that our tax dollars pay for both. Our tax dollars pay for uh, gender reassignment surgeries. Yeah, you know, and in 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 things like that, where you're like, what? But then um, they also pay for for keeping people alive. It's a strange yeah. thing. So I'm I mean I'm super thankful for that, and uh, as a practical way, like it makes me thankful for paying taxes in that sense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Wild man. Wow. Well, I appreciate you sharing it a little is. bit of your story. That's uh, yeah, that's really heavy, man. And we pray for your dad and pray for your family because it's just the thing that mm-hmm. 
they're going to, it's just going to weigh over you guys. It's just hard. But we pray that God gives you peace and makes that lighter and um, continues to mm-hmm. give your family and your dad comfort. And um, yeah, for those who are watching too, maybe you've experienced it as well. We pray peace for you as well. And yeah, um, you know, it's uh, it's becoming more and more popular and a lot of people mm-hmm. are doing it for a lot of reasons. Maybe they don't necessarily or they shouldn't entertain it. Um, but, uh, man, God, God is still in control. Yeah. Even when things seem so out of control. Yes. Yeah. And in, in some ways too, I think God can, he's never not in control of it, but it's almost like he's letting it spin out a little faster than we'd like. Yeah. So that we have to run back to him and like, and, and abide in him closer. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then, I mean, I've experienced that in my life. It's like those times of suffering. Mm-hmm. He's 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 like, no, 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 come back to me, come yep. back to me, come back yep. to the source, to the the strong tree. And you hold on, mm-hmm. and and so, just another word to those like who are going through stuff like that. You accept that invitation to just run back to the Father, yeah, and to Christ, and 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 trust the Holy Spirit to be comforting you. And um, it's an amazing gift that we're given. Yeah, it really is, and I. I see that in my life all the time. It's always through suffering where he gets my attention and says, hey, I'm still here. And it's like, oh, yeah. I've, yeah, I've been trying to do things on my own or trying to navigate this alone, thinking that I got it. And it's like, no, no, cling close and all mm-hmm. will be well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to connecting again. Absolutely. God bless, bro.